1955, a historic scientific study was published in the Journal of the American Medical Association. The remains of 300 U.S. soldiers killed during the Korean War were autopsied. Their average age was just 22 years old. The report detailed that 77% of the young men were afflicted with a condition called atherosclerosis, the disease process where blood vessels narrow, preventing oxygen-rich blood from reaching critical tissue and muscle like the heart and brain. There it is. America's number one killer right there before your eyes. Although the study surprised many physicians, it further supported what a handful of doctors had already suspected. Atherosclerosis, the major cause of heart attack and stroke, was not hiding within the body until an individual matured into middle age, but rather commenced in early childhood. But even the scientists who predicted this were perplexed by research being conducted across the Pacific Ocean, some 7,000 miles away. A similar investigation of Asian men aged 20 to 30 revealed that less than 2% had any suggestion of heart disease. How could this be? 77% to just two. One need look no further than the diverse diets of the two nations of the United States and the People's Republic of China. The Western, rich in fatty foods, the Eastern comprised primarily of rice and vegetables. While Americans were lavishly consuming countless TV dinners, hamburgers, fries, malts, and eggs during the 1950s, over 30 million Chinese perished due to starvation. But today, these lines of diversity have thinned. China's modern opening door economic policy has introduced more than just free trade. Fast food franchises now blot the Far East landscape. And a one-family, one-child government policy provides a sometimes plentiful bounty for China's younger generations. Combine these dietary issues with the fact that a third of the world's cigarettes are smoked in China, and the one-time nearly heart disease-free nation now calls heart attack and stroke its number one killer. How can the largest nation in the world with nearly 1.3 billion citizens curtail what could become an epidemic to its citizens? Please join us as Chinese and American heart specialists unite to confront this challenging diagnosis in the heart of China. It's Daybreak Tuesday, Huangpu Square in Shanghai. Thousands fill the park, participating in a vast array of traditional exercise practices. Many Chinese believe this daily ritual balances the yin and yang, the positive and negative of the body, a custom that provides for a long, healthy life. Some 6,000 miles away, an entourage of physicians and technicians from Phoenix await a connection in San Francisco for an aircraft that will carry them on a journey of enlightenment. Dr. Ted Dietrich, the leader of the team, has been invited as the first American co-chair of China's largest medical meeting, the Great Wall Conference on Cardiology. Although traveling as an instructor, the next seven days will bring about far more learning than teaching. Dietrich, like many other Westerners not well versed in modern day China, departs with an almost antiquated knowledge of what he will encounter. Knowledge that will soon be dramatically transformed. I envision the things that I've sort of recognized as being China. I'm sure we're going to see a lot of rickshaws. I think we'll uh, see a lot of people uh, screwing around on bicycles. And I would imagine that um, we're going to 
find that the level of technology and the physicians we deal with probably still are working in uh, what we hear in the United States um, uh, think of as sort of uh, ancient uh, Chinese or, or Asian uh, medicine. And I think psychologically, we're really prepared for that. I have a five seven page in the following. Customer for operating. Customer loss manual. Here in Shanghai, where Dietrich is scheduled to arrive in just a few hours, Dr. Sam Chui Xian examines five-year-old Huang Xu Tieng. Little Xu Tieng has been admitted to stabilize a medical condition almost unheard of here in China as recently as 10 years ago, diabetes related to a high-fat diet. Dr. Wu Jing Lei, the director of the Children's Hospital at Shanghai Medical University, has seen a distinct change in the disease patterns of his country. In past time, we're only facing some infectious disease uh, or malnutrition. But now, there's a more and more Western-style fast food on the street. In past times, the rice is the main diet, including some vegetables. But now we have a lot of choices, especially for a young generation. We have a lot of eggs, milks, and meats. So I think we have, now we have enough protein, enough fat. So I think the diet has been changed a lot. Now the rice has only occupied a very small percentage of our diet. So I think it's, it's changing a lot. <laughs> From 1959 to 1961, over 30 million Chinese citizens perished during an ambitious government program called the Great Leap Forward. Malnutrition, almost unheard of in Western civilization at the time, was claiming entire villages throughout the Chinese countryside. Fast forward 40 years and to young Xu Cheng. How could it be that today more and more children like Xu Tieng are suffering from ailments most commonly caused by another form of unhealthy eating habits, overindulgence? Much of this problem can be attributed to a government-instituted directive addressing China's overpopulation crisis. Today, over 1.3 billion people, one-fourth of the world's inhabitants, live in China. Fearing that unbridled growth in the nation's masses would lead to a catastrophic deficiency in resources like food, water, and medical care, the Communist Party acted swiftly. In 1978, it instituted a one-family, one-child family planning policy. Practiced diligently in the nation's urban areas, the policy has led to a new generation of pampered youth aptly tagged the Little Emperors. And when the coddled child becomes the chubby child, many of them end up here, in another craze that's new to China, the weight loss clinic. Professor Zhao Donghai, a renowned obesity expert and chief physician at the Shengshan Hospital in Shanghai, has observed this problem firsthand. The reason for obesity in children is because they are eating too much and not exercising enough. They used to walk upstairs but now use the elevator. They used to walk places but not travel by car. They also sit around watching television and play with computer games too much. Children have been spoiled because of the one-child policy. Another reason is the changing of lifestyle. People are making more money, so they eat more and have more enjoyment. However, their awareness in maintaining good health and preventing obesity cannot keep up with the rising economy. Perhaps the greatest contributor to the fattening of the country's waistline can be attributed to the fattening of the average Chinese citizen's wallet. 
Opulence, a term once despised by the old party, has now become decidedly in vogue. Deng Xiaoping, China's leader for almost 20 years beginning in 1978, declared, to get rich is glorious. The nation's standard of living has been progressively on the rise since Deng opened China to the West, both diplomatically and economically at the beginning of his leadership tenure. Steady, double-digit economic growth has elevated 700 million Chinese citizens from poverty into the middle class. To merely scan the skylines of great Chinese cities like Shanghai and Beijing is palpable proof of its ever-rising status. One company erecting many of these high-rise structures, including the soon-to-be-opened Ritz-Carlton Hotel, is the Taihe Holding Company in Beijing. The construction and real estate industries are but a few of many that have benefited greatly from this burgeoning Chinese economy. But one business has been slower to capitalize, as observed by Taihe chairman Wang Wei. The market is good and is open. The rapid growth of the economy in China will only increase the demands for this market, not decrease for sure. Many Chinese cannot receive good medical care even if they want to. There is a large market need for sure. Everyone in China has strong feeling about this, particularly people with high or middle income level who want to spend money on health services. Now, in hospitals, Generally, each doctor must see 40 to 50 patients every day. The doctors basically determine whether the patients need to be hospitalized or if they can go home with medication. This is not a responsible way to take care of patients, but they cannot do anything about it. There are too many patients standing in line and need to be taken care of. That's why I said that the market is huge in China and is getting bigger and bigger. Throughout China's urban areas, companies like Taihe and healthcare establishments alike are transforming this discrepancy at a rapid pace. Taihe has partnered with American businessman Kevin McDonald to build a private hospital in Beijing. It will be the first international standard health hospital in China. The joint venture is designed to capture a segment of the escalating and underserved cardiovascular patient market. This is China Heart Hospital. In terms of healthcare development, cardi the cardiovascular field has grown to be, you know, the number one segment of the medical industry, not just in China but throughout the world. Cardiovascular disease affects about 120 million people in China. The training of those cardiothoracic doctors, m many of them have been trained in America. In 1996, there were less than 100 in all of China. Many believe this lack of classically trained heart surgeons in China, skilled in the art of scalpels, incisions, saws, and bypass, may actually trigger a more rapid evolution of heart care in their country.